now available from National Geographic Home Video. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And where there's a volcano, that's where you'll find Maurice and Katya Kraft. From Iceland to Hawaii, these death-defying scientists risk their lives in hot pursuit of active volcanoes. Their tools are cameras. Their mission is to capture nature's most powerful spectacle on film. Join National Geographic on this unforgettable journey to the edge of the volcano. Welcome to Southern Africa's Savuti. Here, hope dawns each morning. But the night spreads fear across the land. When the day ends, the dreaded hunt begins. Journey with National Geographic to witness the rule of the lions of darkness. And now, our feature presentation. The heart of Africa is aflame. Lava is the hot blood of a land alive to its very core. A land that lifts itself into icy climbs three miles high and plunges back into the abyss. A great rift cleaves this living heart, creating a land of awesome diversity with wildlife to match. Africa's darkest forest, its deepest lake, and its highest mountain range all lie within the living heart of a land caught in the act of creation. A land of extremes, of ice and fire, fire and ice. Volcanoes are just the most dramatic part of the violent geologic upheaval that is the Great Rift. But without the rift, Africa's heart would probably be empty, as flat and dry as Australia's. The Great Rift is a tear in the continent, formed as underlying tectonic plates move apart. Mountains are forced up, catching the wind and generating rain. The rainwater is an immense expanse of tropical rainforest, 
and fills the deepest valleys with great lakes. Zaire's Virunga National Park contains all of this in microcosm. Virunga National Park was the dream of American Carl Akeley. Akeley revolutionized natural history museums, sculpting exact replicas of animals and grouping them in their natural settings. He also invented the first movie camera designed for use in the field. Meandering in Africa is the film he made of his 1921 expedition to the far reaches of the Congo in search of the elusive mountain gorilla. For six weeks, he traveled through an Africa alive with the energy and color of diverse traditional cultures. He steamed up the Lualaba, a tributary of the wide and wild Congo, to a place where the only white men were missionaries or big game hunters. It was a world still ruled by tribal law and the vagaries of nature. Local tribes were employed by Akeley to convey the expedition to a remote volcanic wilderness that today lies along Zaire's eastern border. Big game hunters had shot gorillas there. All their scientific gear and all the comforts of home were carried 10,000 feet up the steep volcanic slopes by resolute porters. Akeley felt the days he spent in search of gorillas were the most difficult in his life, but they proved worth it. A family of gorillas spotted him and actually climbed a tree to get a better look. Akeley was the first person to suggest that gorillas were wholly acceptable citizens and not the wicked villains of popular belief. He was delighted to find himself the object of their curiosity. Believing them the closest akin to man, he even tried to begin a conversation with them, but they bolted. Enthralled by the gorillas, Akeley campaigned to protect them. He wrote, The gorilla is on his way to extinction, as he is neither wary nor dangerous, and is an easy and highly prized prey to the sporting instinct. In 1925, Barunga became the first national park in Africa. Seventy years later, gorillas still play on the slopes where Akeley found them. Akeley predicted, were the gorillas protected, I am certain they would become so accustomed to man that they could be studied in their native surroundings. Today, scientists and tourists alike pay for the privilege of visiting one of Virunga's gorilla families. Originally, the park covered just the gorillas' volcanoes, but thanks to Akeley's vision, its borders were extended a hundred miles north to the very top of the Ruinzores, the fabled mountains of the moon. Their glaciated peaks rise more than 15,000 feet into a world of clouds.
Moist air, rising from the hot rainforests below, produces mist that hides the peaks most of the year. Several expeditions passed by before Stanley finally saw them in 1888 and reported that the legendary mountains of the moon, the mythical source of the Nile, really did exist. This moisture produces uniquely hard ice, which fringes the many glaciers with huge icicles, each one dripping its tiny contribution to the Nile's mighty flow. Every dawn finds a world wrapped in winter. Here plants have evolved into giants and wear furry leaves for insulation. Some plants even produce a kind of natural antifreeze. But when the sun finally breaks through, a splash of tropical color comes alive. A sunbird sits on the 10-foot flower column of a giant lobelia. Feathery insulation protects not only the bird, but the tiny flowers that provide him with sweet nectar. In return, the sunbird helps pollinate the plant. It also eats insects that breed in the tiny reservoirs of antifreeze-protected water trapped within the leaves. The strange plant life of the Ruinzoris changes with altitude. Everlasting flowers, 15-foot lobelias, and the spiky crowns of giant groundsills dominate life in the freezing mist above 12,000 feet. Below them, in the growing warmth, a dwarf forest of heather, orchids, and moss hugs the steep and sodden slopes. Africans have named it the Place of the Beards. Scientists call it Elfin Forest. Moss cushions every surface in the mist, but there is little animal life to add to its charm. Lower still, closer to the tropical heat, wildlife, often of a kind found nowhere else, finds a home among trees of more familiar shape and size. Colors are muted by the mist, but flash brilliantly in the rare shaft of sunlight. The storms over the mountains of the moon spawn hundreds of streams that spill down into the Simliki River, a tributary of the mighty Nile. passes a maze of rain-etched spires. On its journey through Varunga Park, the Simliki River skirts a great rainforest and meanders through palm trees. Here, there's even a bird of prey that feeds on oil palms, the palm nut vulture. On the savanna, it eats carrion, but here, it eats palm nuts, whose bright pigment puts color in its face. It accidentally scatters nuts onto the ground. Manna from above for an African civet. Like the vulture, he eats only the thin skin of the nut, which is rich in oils and highly nutritious. The civet eats almost anything, even snakes. The tiny cobra raises itself to meet its outsized opponent. The civet is too slow to catch the head. He needs to land a body bite so he can shake the snake to death.
It's a risky business. One bite from the cobra could kill a human, let alone a civet. if it moves on. Such a tiny meal isn't worth the risk. The great Simliki flows for miles through these forests of palm trees. They supply food to a host of creatures, monkeys, squirrels, and birds. The palms are the setting of one of the world's strangest nests, that of the palm swift. Using their saliva, the birds glue a tiny pad of their own feathers onto a palm frond. The pad hangs vertically, so the eggs too are glued on with saliva and dangle precariously in space. The swifts themselves are perfect flying machines, spending their lives on the wing, they land only to sleep or to tend their chicks. To incubate her eggs, the female clings to the nest pad with her claws, pressing her belly up against them. When she needs to feed, she simply drops away into flight. The hanging nests are hard for predators to reach, but on windy days, one or both of their eggs are often lost. The newly hatched chick, a thimble-sized creature, must hang on to the pad with its tiny claws every minute of every day or fall to a certain death. Its parents are combing the skies for insects at 80 miles an hour. They visit the nest some 20 times a day to regurgitate food for the chick. On this rich diet, its tiny flippers will soon grow into an adult's sweeping scimitar wings. The chick must literally hang on for dear life, but a month from now, it will let go and drop into instant expert flight. Eventually, the palm grows thin out as savanna replaces the forest. The shining Simliki winds through the savanna, finding its way to one of the world's richest lakes, Lake Edward, gateway to the volcanoes, the fiery heart of Arunga. Nestled against the western wall of the Great Rift Valley, the waters of this lake breed a strange spectacle. When the lake flies hatch, their mating swarms make it look as if the lake itself were on fire. They rise from the surface in their countless millions, a feast for birds and fish. The lake's incredible fertility is governed by its huge herds of hippos. They're everywhere. Along the lake shore, in all the streams and waterholes, 
and in the mud. Hippos spend most of their daylight hours like this. Their skin loses moisture quickly, and they would soon dehydrate without their wallows. In some places in Virunga, wallowing turns into a beautifying mud bath. Along the banks of the Rutsudu River, deposits of fine white clay turn the hippos into living art on an epic scale. Face painting, two tone jobs, even racing stripes are seen. A quick dip, and the slate swiped clean. Here, in the center of Arunga, the hippo is king. There are 23,000 of them, and their influence is felt everywhere. Their wallows and tracks modify the shoreline. Huge quantities of dung enrich the waters, supporting a whole suite of insects, fish, and birds. Hippos govern life here not with their razor-sharp canines, which they use only to fight among themselves, but with their gargantuan appetites. Hippos graze with their sharp-edged lips, cutting a two-foot swath like living lawnmowers. They crop the grass very short, too short for their main competitors, elephant and buffalo. Grazing in huge numbers, they've created hundreds of square miles of hippo lawns, excluding many of their rivals from this rich lakeside grass. But hippos have delicate muzzles. A few thorny twigs prevent their grazing, allowing bushy thickets and long grass to invade the lawns, food and cover for bushbuck and buffalo. while elephants feed on the reeds that the hippos do not eat. The hippos' influence on both land and water helped make Virunga a richer, more varied place. Another reason for the variety is that here, where forest meets savanna, animals characteristic of both habitats are found. There are two kinds of buffalo here who often herd together. The Cape buffalo, a creature of the plains with wide and heavy horns, and the forest buffalo, small and reddish, with horns better shaped for getting between trees. Because the hippos must return to their watery wallows each day, their influence ends just a few miles from the lake's shore. Beyond that, Below the rift valley wall, another creature holds sway, an antelope, the Uganda cob. Here, on a traditional mating ground called a lek, the finest males concentrate to compete for mates. This is the testosterone zone. Uncomfortably spaced, Less than 50 yards apart, each male poses conspicuously, a living billboard for himself. On her day of estrus, a female arrives to choose a mate. All the males in the lek are above average specimens, but the strongest, most desirable fathers for her offspring are those with territories at the center of the mating ground. To get to them, she must run the gauntlet of the lesser males.
She gives him the slip. But as she gets closer to the center, the males become higher ranking, more worthy of her consideration. She has her sights on something better. Again, she makes a break. This is who she's after, an alpha male who greets her with a fine display, advertising his superiority. This time she mates willingly. It's all over in a matter of seconds. Male mating privileges come at a price. These core territories are won and kept by fierce fighting. A couple of weeks is about as long as any male lasts on one of these prime sites. Then, weakened by stress, he will be forced out and replaced. By always choosing to mate with the victorious males at the center, the females are guaranteed the best available fathers for the next generation of cob. South of the savannah rise the Virungas, the volcanoes that give the park its name. The influence of their inner fires is felt throughout the area. Hot springs emerge in many places. And as there was life on the mountaintops at freezing temperatures, here life blooms at the boiling point. Algae flourishes, and just as vegetation changed with temperature on the mountains, here too the kind and color of algae changes as the water grows cooler farther from the source. Some hippos seem to enjoy a hot mud wallow, especially the old rheumatic ones. These have moved as close to the hot spring as is comfortable. Reptiles work more efficiently when they are warm, so a morning visit to the springs gets a monitor lizard quickly up to operating temperature. But experience and caution are needed. This younger, less experienced monitor went in too close to the source and was boiled alive and he is not alone in his gruesome fate. Life here must be a series of small, careful moves, not easy if you're a jumper. But when threatened by a hunting rhinoceros viper, the frog will have to make more than cautious hops. What's needed now are great leaps of faith. There are only a few spots where the water is fatally hot and the frogs usually make it across. But this one is caught between a snake and a hot place. A 
another tiny victim of the volcano's fires. Steam gushing from the ground around the volcanoes is common, but every few years, somewhere in the lush forests surrounding their base, something more sinister starts to drift up from the earth. Far below, tree roots have caught fire, sending small smoke signals up to the surface. The volcanoes are turning up the heat, and the forest creatures feel it. There is agitation and tension in the air. Their world is about to explode. Shooting several hundred feet into the sky, the fountain of magma builds up a cone of cinders. When the crater inside the cone fills with lava, it pours out over the rim. Rocks the size of a church tumble into the river, melt and are carried away. Most eruptions last just a few weeks, each building one of the hundreds of cones that pop the face of Virunga. Large animals can flee, but everything else is swept away by these great rivers of fire. The unstoppable wall of lava consumes all life in its path while laying the foundation for its rebirth. Looks like Armageddon, but the volcanic ash is rich, and generous rains feed the regrowth. Within months, there will be patches of green, pioneer plants 
grown from seeds and spores blown from the islands of vegetation that were once themselves active cones. For the volcano preserves even while it destroys. The cones, once the source of all the destruction, become covered in forest. In future eruptions, they'll provide a refuge to plants and animals. Safety on high ground above the lava's reach. Some of the bigger and older islands are home to bands of remarkable refugees. Groups of chimpanzees live here, feeding on the fruit of giant fig trees that cover these ancient cones. Food is not a problem here, but water is. The volcanic ash is completely porous, and there is no surface water at all. So on their daily rounds, the chimps visit hollow trees that hold rainwater and dip for a drink. They get moisture in another way too, one that always brings lots of excitement. The cause of this display, part fight, part celebration, is the discovery of some large juicy tubers. The chimps dig them up and chew them for the moisture. They will even carry them around all day, using them like water bottles, nibbling a bit whenever they get thirsty. This behavior, unique to this area, helps the chimps to survive in a rainforest without water. The living and the dead keep close company under the volcano's spell. Everywhere there are reminders of their destructive power. Fast flowing lava splashing up trees left this forest of eight foot casts. Some Africans call them the soldiers, a fossilized army frozen in time and space. They make perfect guardians for the most bizarre places in Virunga. Clearings in the forest, carpeted with sickly-looking grass, they are called mazukus. They harbor a strange and lethal secret. Everywhere there are bones, bones and bodies. Bats, birds, butterflies and buffalo. An indiscriminate killer as it were, one that wipes out anything that breathes old mummified bodies lying next to those that died just yesterday. During the heat of the day, we see only the victims, the sickly plants and the bones that litter the clearing. But in the cool of morning, the ghostly killer is visible. 
It is pure carbon dioxide, the fatal breath of the volcanoes. Heavier than air, scentless and tasteless, it hugs the ground, killing any small creature. Large animals are attracted to the grass that is never grazed, and with their heads lowered to eat, they too die after a few breaths. The carcasses attract scavengers, vultures and jackals whose own bodies join the collection. Only in the heat and wind of the day, when the gas rises and disperses, is it fairly safe to enter a mazuku. The monitor lizard is not active until it is warmed up in the sun, so it visits at a safe time of day. But the dead snake it can smell is in a depression where the gas emerges and persists even in the heat. Carbon dioxide works frighteningly fast. The lizard takes a breath, feels the lack of oxygen, so takes another, deeper one. Its tongue and mucous membranes already turning blue from anoxia. It is fast running out of time. Wobbling with weakness, it does the only thing that could save its life. It doesn't have the strength to climb out of the depression, but it has got its head above the level of the gas. Breathing clean air, the effects wear off quickly. After a 10 minute rest, the lizard crawls away, having only narrowly escaped the fate of its would-be meal. Here on the edge of the savannah, palm nut vultures often feed on carrion. In the early morning, one is attracted to the body of a young cob. Already slightly affected by the gas, it hops down to the carcass and is immediately in trouble. Not understanding the problem and hungry, it lowers its head to feed, making the same mistake so many others have made before, here in Africa's strangest cemetery. following morning, when the ghostly killer hides from the warming sun, the vulture has joined the cob in the dreamless sleep of the mazuku. But the volcanoes don't just destroy life. They also create unique conditions for its continual evolution. The volcanoes themselves evolve, eventually becoming extinct. Their steep slopes become covered by a blanket of lush forest. Like the mountains of the moon, the Virungas are usually swathed in thick mist. mist that hides the park's most precious inhabitants, the mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas live in family groups under the protection of a dominant silver-backed male. 
They have always been few in number, so any loss is sorely felt. But living under the park's protection, their numbers have grown. In recent years, they have begun to pay back the favor. Now it's the gorillas that are protecting the park. Tourists have spent hundreds of dollars for the privilege of spending just an hour with these enchanting creatures, hard currency that helps support the park. Because their vegetarian diet is so moist, mountain gorillas seldom drink. But this group not only drinks, they play in and with the water, something only rarely seen. Perhaps leaves decomposing in the water have turned it into a tasty tea. Or perhaps they're just having fun. Scientists are studying the gorillas, trying to understand their behavior and their kinship with us. But humans, it seems, are not the only naturalists on these slopes. While their cousins, the chimpanzees, regularly eat small animals that they capture, gorillas don't behave that way. Intensely fascinated and amazingly gentle, gorillas see other animals as objects of curiosity, not as possible food. A neighboring silverback has brought his group close and is advertising his presence by beating his chest. The resident male answers with a display of his own size and strength, prompting one of his females to give him a little hug, looking for reassurance. While the rest of the group shows scant interest, the two males pose parallel to each other, displaying their massive heads and shoulders, their arched silvery backs, and beating their barrel chests in a highly ritualized show. These displays, wrongly interpreted by early explorers, gave the gorilla an undeservedly savage reputation. But when Carl Akeley met his first gorillas, he immediately felt their kinship with us. As soon as you have anything to do with the gorilla, Akeley wrote, the fascination of studying him begins to grow on you, 
and you instinctively begin to speak of the gorilla as he, in a human sense. In 1926, Akeley returned to Virunga, the park he helped to establish to study the gorillas. He camped in this glade, which he described as one of the loveliest and most tranquil spots in the world. Its serenity is soothing, even today. But the park does lie along Zaire's borders with Rwanda and Uganda, a region with a turbulent modern history. Surrounded by people and their problems, the park's future is uncertain at best. Carl Akeley spent just three days in camp before he suddenly died. He was buried here, where his heart was. His ghost is still kept company by the gorillas he so loved. And on a clear day, you can still look out as he did and see the heart of Africa spread before you. One of the world's most spectacular national parks, Virunga. Carl Akeley wrote, Sanctuary is not sanctuary unless it is absolute. Akeley believed that Virunga National Park had saved the gorillas for all time, that the great silverbacks, like Krugabo here, would be left in peace to raise generation after generation. Since this film was made, tragic events have proven him wrong. Three quarters of a million Rwandan refugees have settled within and around Virunga. In 1994, members of the Hutu tribe fled into exile here, fleeing the aftermath of a genocidal civil war they had waged against the Tutsi minority in their own country. Stranded upon barren lava flows without even the basics of life, 50,000 died of disease in the first few weeks. As the dead were buried, so it seemed was Akeley's dream of protecting Virunga. Today a new generation is born that never knew life outside of the camps. But people need wood to cook with. and thousands of buildings have been erected, and the source of much of this wood, Virunga National Park. The refugees are literally cutting the park down. Already, 20,000 acres of forest have been cut. Tens of thousands of people enter the park each day to harvest fuel wood and bamboo. A commercial trade in wood has also sprung up, supported in part by the defeated Hutu army. The army acts as a shadow government in the camps, but they also use their trucks to carry wood from the park to sell. And the army stands accused of selling off the park's wildlife. Hippos are being machine gunned and sold for their meat. Their bleached bones clog the shores which were once a living mass of animals. Their population has been halved. And three of the park's silverbacks have been killed. Without the protection of their silverback, the future of all group members is cast in doubt. Rugabo was one of those slaughtered. Akeley wrote, Men have spoken of darkest Africa, 
but the dark chapters of African history are only now being written. That is truer today than ever. Will the guerrillas survive? Only if Akeley's spirit survives in us all. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library.